Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Mother of Mercy, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Teresa, Benedict of the Cross, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I want to begin this talk on confidence in God with this beautiful lesson on divine providence in the words of the great Cardinal John Henry Newman. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments. Therefore, I will trust him. Whatever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In confusion, my confusion may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. He does nothing in vain. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends. He may throw me among strangers, make me feel desolate, make my spirit sink, hide my future from me still. He knows what he is about. On October the 11th, 1998, Pope John Paul II canonized Edith Stein, a Jewish convert to the faith, one of the brightest young philosophers of her day who became a Carmelite nun, was later martyred by the Nazis precisely because she was a Jew by birth and a Catholic religious by faith. And at her canonization, the Holy Father praised her in these words. The spiritual experience of Edith Stein is an example of extraordinary interior renewal. A young woman in search of the truth has become a saint and a martyr through the silent workings of divine grace. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, who from heaven repeats to us today all the words that mark her life. Far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. A few days before her arrest and deportation to a Nazi death camp, Sister Teresa Benedicta was offered a chance to escape and flee the country. They knew the Gestapo was coming for them. She turned it down. She said, I won't do it. Why should I be spared? Is it right that I should gain no advantage from my baptism? If I cannot share the lot of my brothers and sisters, my life, in a certain sense, is wasted. She died in the gas chamber at Auschwitz on August the 9th, 1942. Shortly before her death, staring death in the face, looking back on her life, she wrote these words. What did not lie in my plans lay in God's plans. When night comes and retrospect shows that everything was patchwork and much which one had planned left undone. When so many things rouse shame and regret, then take all as it is, lay it in God's hands and offer it up to him. In this way, we'll be able to rest in him, actually to rest, and to begin the new day like a new life. If I had to cite one attribute, one virtue that sets a saint apart from the rest, I would say that along with their outstanding charity and humility, it is their unfailing confidence in God. Abandonment to divine providence. In my years as a mission preacher and confessor, I have found that one of the hardest things to do is to move people to trust in God. 
to get them somehow to accept the fact that God really does love them and each one of us more than we can ever imagine. Now, I have known people who believe that no one has ever loved them and no one ever could, not even God. And it is true to say that often, very often in life, the most difficult act of worship, the most heroic act of worship is to trust in God. And I've found that for many people, the hardest thing to meditate on is the joy and even the reality of heaven. And it is because so many people have never known true joy in their lives. Oh, maybe fleeting moments of it. But true happiness, lasting joy, most people, I think, have never known it. There's no doubt in my mind there are millions of people in the face of this earth who have never known a single day of true happiness in their lives. And there are many poor souls who just want to die. They have a deep longing for death. They pray for it. It doesn't come. I think of the words of Job. It's not man's life on earth a drudgery. We all know that life on earth is a test. We are told in Scripture that we are going to be tried like gold in the fire. And nowhere in the Bible will you find where God promised anyone perfect happiness here on earth. God promised that to us only in the life to come. (coughs) Only for those who pray. Only for those who trust in Him. Now, there are millions of people, lifelong Christians, who go through their entire lives without ever really understanding the concept, the reality of divine providence so clearly, simply expressed by the Apostle St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, in that all-important verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God makes all things work together for the good of those who love him. Now, if you can just recall that one verse, if you can take it to heart, you will be at peace come what may. In God's will is our peace. In the dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena, God the Father says to St. Catherine, I give my protective care to all who want it, all who pray for it. Jesus Christ is the eternal word of the Father, the image of the invisible God who came into this world to save us and redeem us by his cross. But he also came to show us what God is really like. I have heard it said rightly that if you were the only soul in the world in need of redemption, God still would have become man. Jesus Christ would have come into this world to die for you, you alone. That is the infinite value of a single soul in the sight of Almighty God. Each human person is, in the language of Pope John Paul II, unique, precious, and unrepeatable. God wants you to see that he is not a cold, impersonal, distant force floating somewhere out there in the universe. He is not the pantheistic God of the New Agers. He is the most loving, caring of fathers who wants the best, nothing but the best, for his adopted children. God has a plan for your life that is going to end in eternal glory if only you will cooperate with the graces that God wants to give to you. One thing is for sure, God's plan for your life is infinitely better than anything you can dream up for yourself. You see, God desires our happiness far more than we do our own, and he knows how best to get it for us. His plan is better than anything you can take to the bank. I have no doubt... There may be some of you here who have worked hard all your lives and don't have a whole lot to show for it materially, financially. And we all know people for whom everything in life seems to go wrong. Life is like an endless series of setbacks and letdowns, failures and heartaches with all kinds of anxiety and discouragement that wears them down and brings on temptation and Every day their hearts are weighed down by bitter regrets and memories they just can't let go of. And they make it hard to grow in love and union with God. Uh, In that sense, St. Philip Neary used to say that often we are the carpenters of our own crosses. It is very easy to trust in God when things in life go well. 
It is far more virtuous, far more meritorious to trust in God when they don't. To say, Father, not my will, thy will be done. I had a friend, good friend, passed away a few years ago. But he had lived a hard life. And he never seemed to be able to escape from his past. Um, There were so many family problems and broken relationships that he just could not reconcile. And he spent a good part of his time dwelling on the wounds, the hurts of the past. And for that reason, he was never at peace. He could never be at peace within himself. And he used to come to me with this time and time again. So um, I gave him a prayer for trust. And I told him to say this prayer every day, and he did, and he came back one day and told me that it changed his life. And I want to share with you what is, in my opinion, the most beautiful prayer for trust ever written. Uh, this is the act of trust of St. Claude de la Colombière. He was the spiritual director of St. Margaret Mary. He wrote this. Oh, my God, I am so certain that you watch over those who hope in you, and that when we rely on you for everything, we can lack for nothing that I am determined to live in the future without worry, casting all my cares upon you. Men may strip me of my goods and of my honor. Illness can take away my strength and the means of serving you. I may even lose your grace through sin, but I shall never lose hope. I shall keep it until the last moment of my life, when the efforts of all the devils in hell to take it from me would be in vain. Others may hope for happiness from their riches or from their talents. They may rely on their purity of life or on the severity of their penances, on the alms they have given, or the fervor of their prayers. For my part, Lord, my trust is in my trust. So what does it take for the divine plan in your life to become a reality? It takes confidence in God, humble Prayerful abandonment to divine providence, a key, vital, essential element in your relationship with God, without which it is impossible to grow in the spiritual life. Confidence is the open door to the divine mercy with confession, contrition, and repentance. By our Lord's own command, the inscription, the image of the divine mercy given to the Holy Saint Faustina is Jesu Ufam Tobia. Jesus, I trust in you. Do you realize, friends, that the Bible is essentially a book about trusted God? The Bible, God's written word, gives us a gradual unfolding of God's revelation to humanity, God's plan for our salvation, and God's plan for each one of us. Each one of us, if only we will trust in him. What does the Bible have to say about trust in God? Well, too much to mention here. But in the Old Testament, I think there's one book that stands out among the others. It is the book of Psalms. For example, uh, in the second Psalm, there is a beatitude. Blessed are those who put their trust in the Lord. Psalm 18 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots or horses, but we in the name of the Lord, they will collapse and fall, but we shall hold and stand firm. Is the famous 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 56 says, In God I put my trust, I will not fear. What can mortal men do to me? Confidence in God is a recurring theme in the writings of the saints who are the great masters of the interior life. St. Augustine, greatest theologian of the early church, said, God is not a deceiver that he should appear to support us, and then when we lean upon him, should pull away. Trust, past to God's mercy, the present to God's love, and the future to his providence. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, greatest saint of the 12th century, said, All things upon which you set your trust are yours. Do but expect much of God, and he'll do much for you. Expect but little, and he will do little. St. John of the Cross, Carmelite mystic, doctor of the church, said, Do not be made sad by the adverse events of this life, for you know not the good they bring with them, ordained by God for your everlasting joy. St. Alphonsus Liguori said, When 
did it ever happen that a man had confidence in God and was lost? He who trusts in himself is lost. He who trusts in God can do all things. St. Francis de Sales, doctor of the church, said, Do not look forward to what may happen tomorrow. The same eternal Father who cares for you today will take care of you tomorrow and every day of your life. He will either shield you from suffering or he'll give you unfailing strength to bear it. So be at peace then and put aside all anxious thoughts. St. Therese de Lisieux said, Everything is grace. Everything is the direct effect of our Father's love. Difficulties, contradictions, humiliations, all the soul's miseries, her burdens, her needs, everything, because through them she learns humility, realizes her weakness. Everything is a grace because everything is God's gift. Whatever be the character of life and its unexpected events, to the heart that loves, all is well. To the heart that loves, all is well. Now, one thing that seems to be characteristic of modern living is stress. High anxiety. We're a stressed out society precisely because I think we tend to be too busy for our own good. You know, so many of us lose ourselves in the day-to-day -day chase after the so-called American dream. It brings with it all kinds of unrealistic expectations of material overabundance, complete satisfaction, perfect happiness, and um, we will do just about anything to get it. You know, I have known people who go through their whole lives. They go on for years. They will push themselves, drive themselves, knock themselves out. For what? Small profit, small promotion, small advantage over a competitor, a rival in business or professional life. Years go by. It happens time and time again. They don't find the satisfaction they are looking for. Instead, they find anxiety, worry, pressure, disappointment. And isn't it true, friends, that we seem to spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about what other people think about us? We're concerned about everybody's opinion but God's. There's a great line in The Imitation of Christ, which is the second most widely read Christian classic after the Bible. Um, it says, What care I for the vain and worthless opinions of men? Bill Cosby likes to say, I don't know the secret to success, but I know the secret to failure. It's try to please everybody. Right? You can't do it. Right? Right? People try to get ahead, meet career goals. They look for emotional fulfillment all too often in human relationships that let them down. At the same time, the world tells you, you've got to have it all, you've got to do it all. You're the master of your own destiny. It all depends on you, you, you. Now, I think this is an especially big problem for women today with the advent of the women's movement. Uh, it seems to me, and this is just my opinion, Women in particular are under tremendous societal pressure to conform to the idea that they cannot and should not find happiness in fulfillment in marriage, motherhood, and family life. You know, this is the relentless propaganda of the radical feminist movement. They give the idea that to be a good wife and a good mother is not enough. In fact, it means nothing. You know, if you're a woman with a big family today, you got to be countercultural, right? How often do they hear it? You know, oh, uh, she's only a stay-at-home mom. She is just a housewife, you know. When they're out with the kids, uh, when they're out with the kids at the mall or the supermarket or uh, Walmart, people take these little jabs at them, you know, these little snide comments. Uh, one friend of mine was telling me that she was in the uh, in supermarket with the kids. And uh, there was a woman standing beside her, kind of looking down at the kids. <laughs> and she said to her, Oh, are they all yours? Oh, you poor thing. How many kids have you got? Hope you're not thinking of heaven anymore. <laughs> Ever heard of overpopulation? Hmm? Ever heard of birth control? You see, this is the convoluted thinking of worldly, selfish people short-sighted people um, who don't see children as a gift from God. 
but has a burden, an economic liability. Don't see those kids are intended by God to be your help, your comfort, your support in the loneliness and hardship of old age. For the last 30 years, women have been browbeaten to cave into the idea they're only going to find true satisfaction in job, career, and status. And in general, it is not working. Now, I understand the financial pressures that uh, many couples are under, right? But it seems to me there are millions of women who are not happier, not more fulfilled by a job and career with a family out on the periphery of life. In fact, more women are stressed out, burned out, disillusioned. Bit of a digression, but the point is this. With all this intense pressure to succeed, to be somebody in the sight of the world, sooner or later, too many of us will come face to face with the one thing in life we Americans seem to dread the most. The dread fear of the American psyche. The dirty word, failure. Failure. You see, if you don't have a supernatural outlook on life, If your heart is not set on God, the things of God, failure will bring nothing but frustration. Frustrated idealism leads to cynicism, pessimism, depression. But failure in God's plan, remember this, can be merciful. How so? If it humbles us, if it drives us to our knees in prayer, if it drives us into the loving arms of God where we might never be otherwise, if it helps us to recognize the illusion of worldly desires, and if it turns our hearts back to God, God whose ways are not our ways. That's why in the order of salvation, sometimes it is the case that the worst things that happen to us turn out to be the best things that happen to us. All right, let's be honest. Hmm? I wonder how many of us would never have come to him. How many of us would never have turned our lives around had it not been for some experience of the cross. Some crushing disappointment in life. Hmm? For those who live the love of Christ, uh, those who sincerely seek God, there's the old Latin maxim, omnia in bonum. Everything for the good. You see, if you're sincerely seeking God, if you're someone who loves God and is trying to live in the state of grace, think about this. What do you think can happen to you that God has not foreseen and permitted only for the sake of a greater good? Your good and the good of others. St. Augustine said, God does not make evil. But God sees to it that evil should not become the worst. He said, suffering is not a punishment for damnation. It's a medicine for salvation. God could in no way permit the kind of evil out of which he could not bring good. It's hard to believe sometimes. We've got God's word on it. (laughs) God has a plan. Ever heard the old saying, want to make God laugh? To make God laugh, tell him your plans. Huh? (laughs) To the heart that loves, all is well. Come what may. Hmm? See, this is where faith is put to the test, right here. See? Come what may, in life's darkest hours, whatever it might be, the tragic loss of a loved one, the unforeseen sickness, the debilitating disease, having to live with chronic pain, the financial loss, the layoff that comes out of nowhere, the stock that goes south, the bottom that drops out, the accident in traffic, the broken heart, the failed marriage, the bitter pain of divorce, the loneliness that hangs overhead like a dark cloud, the rejection, the humiliation, the injustices we suffer from others. The loss of one's home and possessions, fire, flood, hurricane, tornado, whatever. Even in this, God has a plan. Omnia in bonum. Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, there's a great distinction to be made between prayer and worship. 
Some of us don't get it. Hmm? Prayer is the expression of the human will to Almighty God, but worship, true worship, is accepting God's will no matter how it presents itself. You want to be a saint? Remember this. We're called to be saints, all of us. Nothing less than that, right? A saint is someone who not only accepts the cross, embraces the cross, a saint is someone who actually loves God's will and embraces God's will and truly wills what God wills, even if what God wills for us is suffering. Listen to the words of Bishop Sheen. In the order of divinity, there is nothing accidental. There is never a collision of blind forces hurting us at random. There is instead a meeting of a divine will and a human will that has a perfect trust that ultimate good is meant for it although it may not understand how or why until eternity. Every human being is, in point of fact, like a baby in the arms of a loving mother who sometimes administers medicine. God sends us all the happenings of everyday life as so many invitations to holiness in his service. The baby cries. The egotist protests. But the saint in the arms of God is content because she knows, God knows exactly what is best for her. Thus, the bitter and the sweet, the joys and the sorrows of each moment are viewed as the raw material of sanctity. Now, too many of us base our entire lives on a false premise. Terrible misunderstanding of God's role in our lives. You see, we tend to have everything planned out for ourselves. Everything in life we think, is very carefully, fully scripted. Um, Where we're going to go, what we're going to do, what we're going to be, how it's going to be, usually with no reference to God. Right? No reference to divine providence, no prayer, no spiritual discernment. And at the same time, you see... um, We look on God as the one who is supposed to make our plans succeed and our dreams come true. When things go right, we take the credit. When things go wrong, blame God. Right? But our minds are way too tiny to understand God's mysterious plans. Okay, so don't lose sight of the big picture here. You see, there's only one real ticket to success. Confidence in God, conformity to the divine will. As Christians, we should have it drilled into our heads that success means getting to heaven. Failure is the loss of your soul. Hell, that is the ultimate failure. My friend Bishop David Ricken of Green Bay always says, uh, remember that your resume will be forgotten two minutes after they plant you into the ground. Hmm? That's how long the world is going to remember you. Hmm? Um, Isn't it true that kids, when they're growing up, are always asked the same question by adults? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? That's not the best question to ask, right? There's a much better question than that. The question that should be asked of kids is, what does God want you to be? Kids are rarely ever asked that question. You know, when I was a teenager, <laughs> I had my whole life planned out for me. And I had the whole thing mapped out. I had a blueprint for success. I was going to make a career out of the service. Uh, I was going to put my 20 years in and retire young with a nice pension. And I thought, well, maybe I'd find a nice wife and have a nice family and i get a nice little job somewhere where the sun shines, have a nice, comfortable little life for myself. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> my plans fell through. It didn't happen. And you know what? Every day I thank God that it didn't happen. It was merciful. It was certainly merciful for some poor woman. <laughs> Think of all that God spared some poor woman when I didn't get married. Hmm? 
You see, God had other plans. You know, some people ask me, how do you know when you have really a true vocation of the priesthood? And I said, it's kind of like this. Um, it starts out like a crazy idea, but it's a crazy idea that won't go away. Hmm? But the point is this. Remember this. Our finite minds are way too small to see God's hidden hand in the things he permits to happen. Think about this. Just as the Son of God was hidden in the swaddling clothes of the babe of Bethlehem, just as the reality of Calvary made present again is hidden in the mystery, the offering of the Mass, just as the physical reality of Christ's presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity is hidden under the appearance of bread and wine in the Holy Eucharist, so is the divine will hidden in the ordinary things, the ordinary events that touch our lives. And friends, if you don't understand that, you don't understand the mercy of God. Hmm? The Holy Capuchin Friar, Father Solanus Casey, who I'm not related to, unfortunately, you know, used to say that most people will never find out what God can do with their lives because they never allow the divine artist to go to work. He said, the biggest mistake we make in life is to set limits on God's power and God's goodness. Let me ask you this. Hmm? Do you think that a small child, a little kid, with crayons and finger paints and manila paper, could create a greater work of art than did the great masters? Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Rembrandt. Do you think that an infant, a little baby, could compose a greater concerto than did uh, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin? Do you think that you, with a hammer, hammer and chisel in your hands, could make a more magnificent statue than did Michelangelo or Bernini? No, God is the divine artist as long as we allow him to work in us, as long as we trust in him. Listen to the words of Padre Pio, St. Pio Quetrochin, who a spiritual daughter he was giving spiritual direction to was great, in great suffering, great turmoil. He said, The soul that is destined to reign with Jesus Christ in eternal glory must be remodeled by the blows of hammer and chisel. But what are these blows by which the divine artist prepares this stone, that is to say, the chosen soul? Dear sister, these strokes of the chisel are the shadows, fears, temptations, spiritual torments and agitation with a bit of desolation and even a physical pain. Thank the infinite mercy of the Eternal Father then for treating your soul in this way, for it is destined to be saved. Hmm? Did you ever see a large, intricate tapestry from the reverse side? Hmm? If you look at a tapestry from the reverse side, it looks like a mass, a mess of stitches going every which way, and you can't even tell what that image is supposed to be until you look at it from the front, until you see it from the artist's point of view, you see? That's the way it's going to be for us in the next life. It's only then some of us will see the masterpiece being created by the divine artist in our lives. Hmm? Now, you all remember... After the terrorist attack on New York, the events of 9-11, it seemed like all of a sudden there was this great spiritual reawakening in America, and everybody was turning back to God. Right? People rushed back to the churches. The churches were full for two, three weeks afterward. Everywhere there were signs and posters and bumper stickers. United we stand. And God we trust. God bless America. Everything was God, God, God. All of a sudden, it was all over. Time passed, the shock wore off, soap operas came back on, game shows, talk shows, sitcoms were back on, it was business as usual, and all, all that talk about God, and God we trust faded into the background. Churches were half empty again. People had their emotional uplift, their shot in the arm, it was all over, right? And now there's a movement to get the national motto and God we trust off of the money. You see, the ACLU is up to their old tricks again, right? 
I think sometimes maybe we should take the words in God we trust off of the money. You know why? Because the truth of the matter is, we don't trust in God, we trust in the money. The God Almighty buck. The triune God of the modern world is money, sex, and power. God help us, we're not kidding anybody, right? Now, the Bible shows us clearly that one of the things that is always most displeasing to God is lack of trust. Lack of trust on the part of chosen souls, individuals and nations alike. You want to be displeasing to God? Show him that you don't trust him. Think of the Israelites in the desert. The Israelites had seen God's awesome power time and time again to bring them out of bondage in Egypt. They had seen the God of Abraham smack down the Egyptians with ten plagues. They had seen God part the Red Sea and drown the Pharaoh's army. They had seen manna from heaven, water from the rock. Still, still they complained, they grumbled, they murmured against the Lord. They wanted to turn back. They longed for the flesh pots of Egypt, symbolic of sin. God made them wander in the desert for 40 years until that faithless generation had passed away. You see, lack of trust is dangerous. It will taint your relationship with God. Listen to our Lord's word to St. Faustina. My heart is sorrowful, Jesus said, because even chosen souls do not understand the greatness of my mercy. Their relationship with me is in certain ways filled with mistrust. How much that wounds my heart. Remember my passion And if you do not believe my words, at least believe my wounds. Why are you afraid? Why do you tremble when you are united with me? Most dear to me is the soul that believes in my goodness and has complete trust in me. I hate my confidence upon it and give it all that it asks. Now I believe that one of the reasons why there is so much unhappiness, pessimism, Discontent, despair, and emotional instability in the world all around us today is that millions of people still see no meaning, no purpose in their lives, precisely because most of them do not know God. Hmm? The famous psychologist Carl Jung used to say that in 30% of his patients he found no discernible neurosis. But they were people who felt that their lives had no meaning. They were people who had no faith. Hmm? Are you aware of the fact that 34,000 Americans commit suicide every year? And many more than that attempt suicide. Right? The rate of suicide among our young people, for example, has risen 300% in the last 15 years. Why? I believe the answer couldn't be more clear. Because our young people are not being taught the faith. They are not being taught to know and love God. Their lives have no meaning, no purpose. You see, what you see as the meaning of life, the purpose in life, is going to dominate everything that you do in the way that you do it. There is an old story from the Middle Ages about a man who came upon three stone cutters at work. He walked up to the first stone cutter and said, What are you doing? The stone cutter said, Can't you see? What's it look like I'm doing? I'm chipping away at this rock. He went to the second stone cutter and said, What are you doing? The second one said, Can't you see? I'm doing my job. I got a family to support. Trying to make a living. He went to the third stone cutter and said, What are you doing? The third stone cutter said, Can't you see? We're building a great cathedral for the honor and glory of God. It will stand as the center of worship for the people of this place for centuries to come. The holy sacrifice of the mass is going to be offered here every day. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to abide here in the throne of his mercy in the tabernacle. So you see, your outlook on life is going to affect everything you do and the way that you do it. 
We can all see that the more the world becomes de-Christianized, the more it becomes dehumanized. The more it becomes a world without hope, a world in despair. And that is why escapism is the order of the day. Hmm? You know, people try to find all kinds of ways to escape from reality by giving free reign to all kinds of addictions, addictions to drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, gambling, overeating, spending money to excess, compulsive shopping and all the like. Or by wasting time in the kind of mindless entertainment that you find in the television or the movies, the internet. Of course, it does not satisfy. It can never satisfy the deepest longings of the human spirit. It does not bring hope. Something that is essential to confidence in God is the virtue of hope. The Bible calls the virtue of hope the anchor of the soul. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Hold fast to the hope that lies before us. This we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and firm. That's why hope has always been associated with the symbol of the anchor. The virtue of hope was so important to the early Christians that they found 66 different anchors carved into the walls of the catacombs. St. Peter said, We have been born again with living hope in Jesus Christ. Living hope, sure hope, not a false hope. Not the false confidence that is presumption. When we talk about the mercy of God, we've also got to talk about the biggest obstacle to it, which is presumption. It is rampant today in a society that has lost its sense of sin among people who live habitually in mortal sin. You see, we try to rationalize. We say, I hope God will understand. I hope God will see things my way. I'm a nice person. I'm a good person. I hope God will only see the good that I have done. But I'm not going to change. You see, all that is a false hope, an empty hope. It will perish with you when you die. The Bible says, the hope of the wicked shall perish. And that is why the last thing in the world the devil wants you to do is to go to confession. Because confession is the greatest experience of the mercy of God. The greatest source of inner peace. Friends, without the gospel of Jesus Christ, this world does not have a single solitary ray of hope. Remember the communists in Russia? How they tried to build a society without God, an atheistic state? They made all kinds of promises, empty promises. They promised a worker's paradise, equality of the masses, endless prosperity, redistribution of wealth, worldly power. (laughs) It was all a lie. It was all a diabolical lie. The Soviet Union became a nation in despair. What was it like? What was it like living in their cities at the time? Um, The norm was to have like four families living in the same flat. Each family with one burner on the stove. One bathroom for eight couples. (laughs) It was a hopeless situation. The whole rotten system collapsed. That's what's going to happen to this country, by the way, if we embrace socialism. All right? Pope John the 23rd said this, a bit of a digression, we've still got a little time left, right? Pope John the 23rd said, when a nation embraces socialism, two things are inevitable. Loss of prosperity and loss of freedom. My brothers and sisters, we need the mercy of God. I think that as time goes on and we get older, we see more and more how much we need the mercy of God. Isn't it true we make so many good resolutions and we don't keep them? We have so many good intentions and so little seems to come of them. We tell God and we tell ourselves that we're going to do more, we're going to do better, we're going to pray more, give more, love more, and it doesn't happen. Sometimes we fall over and over again. Sometimes God permits it to keep us in humility. It is a world of anxiety. Our country is under attack. The church is under attack. 
The family is under attack, marriage is under attack, our souls are under constant attack. This poor fallen human nature of ours, what can we do but trust in God? You know, the enemies of the church have got all the worldly power on their side. Yeah, they've got the governments, they've got the arms and the ammunition, they've got the money, they've got the movies, they got most of the media, they got the celebrities, they got the news and entertainment medias, they've got the courts, they got the universities, God help us, they've even got some of our seminaries. And all we have is God. And if God is for us, who can be against us? May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.